This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Good morning. Um, yes, the cost benefit of optimal health with sunshine and vitamin D. I'd like to disclose that I've, I receive funding now from Biotech Pharmacal, the Sunlight Research Forum, and MediSun Engineering. And in the past, I've, I've received funding from the Vitamin D Council, the Vitamin D Society, and the UV Foundation. I don't consider these conflicts of interest, but I'd like to disclose them. The objective is to discuss costs and benefits of increasing vitamin D-related behavior which can be both sunlight, uh, perhaps artificial UV, and, and oral intake. The learning objectives are to identify cost reductions of increased vitamin D and compare these to the cost of skin cancers. Because as the Surgeon General's report, and the dermatologist, et cetera, et cetera, telling us, stay out of the sun because you're going to have a risk of skin cancer. Um, I think you'll see eventually that uh, this concern about skin cancer melanoma is essentially the, the tail wagging the dog. So the approach I take is to, first of all, obtain 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration disease incidence relations, obtain the 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration distribution for elderly Americans, the ones most likely to get these um, chronic diseases, then estimate the reductions in disease incidence and mortality rates for increasing 25 hydroxy vitamin D to greater than 40 nanograms per milliliter, then estimate the reductions in deaths, years of life loss, and direct costs of treatment. In the, for evidence sources, I will rely most heavily on results from eco observational and ecological studies. Laboratory studies of mechanisms are considered a support for the role of UVB and vitamin D in maintaining health. And I largely ignore the randomized controlled trials since, as Robert Heaney has explained, and, and uh, Bruce Hollis, uh, most of the randomized controlled trials uh, conducted to date were poorly, poorly designed and, and don't give reliable results. Now, I can only highlight a few of the diseases. So I've, I've looked for diseases that have strong evidence that UVB and or vitamin D significantly affect incidence or mortality rate, and that these diseases comprise a large, large fraction of deaths and direct costs of treatment. So the diseases I'm highlighting would be cardiovascular diseases, diabetes mellitus, cancer, uh, Alzheimer's disease, falls and fractures. So turn first to cardiovascular disease. There are several main categories, ischemic heart disease, stroke, cardiomyopathy or heart failure, hypertensive heart disease, and other CVD. Uh, there are a number of mechanisms uh, uh, known or, or thought to be uh, to explain how vitamin D prevents cardiovascular disease. Uh, for example, it blunts the renin angiotensin system, which then uh, helps lower blood pressure reduces risk of arterial stiffness, uh, diabetes, and insulin resistance, and helps maintain glucose regulation and, and healthy lipid profile. Uh, here's a uh, recent paper on, uh, from Turkey on uh, arterial stiffness and 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Now, the, the horizontal axis is pulse wave velocity. The stiffer the arteries, um, uh, the more, more likely you have, have likelihood there is of high, high blood pressure. So, on the left, we have 25 hydroxy vitamin D in nanograms per milliliter. 10 uh, is seen to be the lower, uh, where you have the stiffest uh, um, um, uh, arteries. Around 40, you have the, the uh, most pliant, uh, uh, compliant arteries. Ventricular stiffness uh, is also important. And again, you have um, a similar situation. Around 10 uh, nanograms, where you have the best uh, function around 40, uh, uh, the worst function, around 40, the best function. Now, I, I love to do ecological studies, especially for cancer, but I have not been able to find a geographical variation in cardiovascular disease uh, 
I, to use in ecological studies. However, there is a very strong seasonal variation of cardiovascular disease and, and heart failure. And here's a study fr from um, Australia. And what they point out is that um, Australia has mild winter. And this is important because it's often said that it's cold temperature that's an important risk factor to explain the seasonal variation in, in cardiovascular disease. Um, but even there with mild winters, they have increases in heart failure and cardiovascular disease. And they point out that increased blood pressure and lack of vitamin D in winter are the most likely causes of the increase. And I think we've heard in previous talks about nitric oxide uh, liberation from UV, and that can help reduce blood pressure in summer. Um, so what I look for is meta-analyses of um, health outcome with respect to 25 hydroxy vitamin D. This is a meta-analysis uh, for cardiovascular disease by Wang et al., published in 2012. And they've um, combined, I think it's 20 or 30 uh, different studies, and they've looked at the adjusted uh, relative risk, uh, taking into account um, body mass index, age, uh, sex, um, uh, probably smoking, um, and, and a few other factors. And what they ha show here is that um, that the bottom is around 20 nanomoles per liter or 8 nanograms per milliliter with a uh, hazard ratio of a, a, a relative risk around 2.2. By the time they get to around 70, 75 nanomoles or 30 nanograms per milliliter, is essentially plateaued out. So we have here an example where, where the disease outcome relation also pretty much agrees with the physiological um, uh, effects as discussed by Robert Heaney. Then I want to take the 25-hydroxy vitamin D distribution for the population and multiply this, these curves times the 25-hydroxy the, um, the, the vitamin D health outcome relationship. And this is from a, a paper by Looker et al. from in Haines uh, 3 data where they go around the country. It's a cross-sectional study of, of um, many parameters, including 25-hydroxy vitamin D. In, in this, the, the, the 50 percentile values around um, 56, 58 nanomoles per liter, or just around 22, 23 nanograms per milliliter, which includes African Americans, Hispanics, uh, Asians, and Caucasians. Um, so you've got um, the people, there are around 5% of the population is around 20, 25 nanomoles per liter, but you also have about 5% of the population of around 90 nanomoles per liter. So if one convolves those two curves, I estimate that raising 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations abo to above 40 nanograms per milliliter for all the population would reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease by about 20% with an uncertainty of plus minus 10%. Now, the, the beneficial effects would phase in over several years because some of the risk factors associated with low 25 hydroxy vitamin D uh, phase in or phase out over, many, over several years. For example, ar arterial stiffness doesn't happen overnight. It happens as a, as over a, s a period of time. And development of, cardi of diabetes takes a t uh, develops over time, uh, et cetera. So, um, you know, the 20% reduction might be what you'd expect after five or 10 years of having all the population at, um, at above 40 nanograms per milliliter. Diabetes mellitus. Um, uh, those with higher 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations have reduced risk of de developing both diabetes type 1 and type 2. One randomized controlled trial found reduced progression from pre-diabetes to diabetes. The mechanisms include effects on insulin sec secretion, insulin sensitivity, and inflammation. Uh, it turns out, however, that, that vitamin D has limited effect on existing diabetes mellitus. So once you get diabetes, uh, raising 25 hydroxy vitamin D is, is not going to re reverse diabetes. Uh, it may reduce some of the adverse effects, but it's, it's not going to have a, a major effect as far as I can tell. So there are about 21 million Americans with diabetes mellitus, and another that know it, and about 8 million who have undiagnosed diabetes. W so, but only 1 million develop diabetes annually in the United States, about 4 to 5 percent uh, of uh, the diabetes every year are, are new cases, and those are the ones we can prevent with vitamin D. Here is a, uh, the 25-hydroxy uh, vitamin D um, relative risk for diabetes, and it's similar to uh, that for cardiovascular disease, although there's much greater uncertainty. 
And you n notice that even though the, the curve um, um, decreases monotonically, after about 75 nanomoles per liter, you can almost draw a straight line, a horizontal line in the, um, uh, for the um, uh, relationship. So it appears that tw a higher 25-hydroxyvitamin D concentration could reduce the incidence of diabetes mellitus by about 25%. But in the short run, this would not have much effect on deaths or years of life loss, so it would have minimal effect on costs. However, in the long run, we could have a significant impact. Cancer, you've heard uh, from Cedric, uh, his, uh, in how he, he and his brother developed the hypothesis and how it took six, six years to get it published, and then it wasn't in an American journal, it was in a British journal. Uh, they've also added breast and ovarian cancer uh, to the UVB vitamin D responsive cancer list in the 1990s. Uh, he showed you this uh, map yesterday, and um, you see it's mainly in the northeast where you have the high rates, uh, Alaska high rates, uh, Hawaii in the south uh, and the west low rates. A little bit of extra uh, 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 colon cancer in the San Francisco Bay Area along the southern coast. Um, I worked for NASA at the time I got involved with these studies, and I was aware of the satellite um, um, instrument measured uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D uh, uh, doses for the United States. And you see it's a very asymmetrical pattern. Um, the highest uh, UVB doses are in Arizona and New Mexico. The lowest are up uh, around Maine and the Canadian border. The reason for the asymmetry is uh, threefold. First of all, on the west coast, you have higher surface elevation, so there's less atmosphere to scatter and attenuate the UVB. Second, you have the prevailing westerly winds that, pu that went across the Rocky Mountains, and so as they come across and try to, and then, r and then the air mass rises, it, it, it compresses the stratospheric ozone layer, and so you have less uh, UVB absorption by the ozone. And in the eastern United States, you have more aerosols from the um, coal-fired power plants more clouds as well. So it's, it's very worthwhile to have this um, asymmetrical pattern because if it were just a latitudinal gradient, it could be due to, uh, for example, temperature or, or something else. But this makes it, if you see this asymmetrical pattern, you know it's UVB. So uh, even though black Americans have darker skin and they have a, a mean 25 hydroxy vitamin D around 16 nanograms per milliliter, versus uh, uh, white Americans around 26 and Hispanics around 20, 21, even they uh, do show a, um, a, a variation in colon cancer linked to uh, UVB. Now breast cancer is similar but a little different. And uh, along the west coast, along the, the just along the coast, you have the higher rates, uh, but you go inland and you have lower rates. And I think the reason is that breast cancer is a cancer that develops very, very rapidly from the small tumors to the large tumors. There, there comes a period when a tumor can only grow by, by once it has a good blood supply and has to develop, uh, uh, has to have angiogenesis or develop blood vessels around the tumor in order to grow. And that can happen very, very rapidly in breast cancer. A as you know, mammography is recommended annually, whereas colon cancer screening is recommended every decade. So, um, um, I think that because of the fog and the cloud along the coast, that uh, in the summer, for example, in San Francisco, we, ha we hardly ever see the sun. It's, it's foggy quite a bit because the hot air in the uh, Central Valley is pulling in the marine air, and we just get a blanket of fog all summer. Uh, the apocryphal story is that Mark Twain said the coldest, summer ever, uh, coldest winter ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. So look at some of the other cancers. Here's uh, kidney cancer females. Uh, very similar patterns, although you have some extra uh, high uh, mortality rates in the northern part of the uh, middle states. Also in Louisiana where they have a lot of chemical factories. And then pancreatic cancer, that's a cancer that's affected by UVB, by smoking, and by diet. And you see that down in the south, the southeast, there's a lot of uh, pancreatic cancer there, and that's linked uh, apparently to both smoking and to diet. Because you look at lung cancer, lung cancer rates are, are very high in the southeast. I used to think it was because there's more smokers in the southeast, but I think that's not, the, I think the smoking rates in this period were probably similar throughout the country. 
But there was a nice study comparing uh, lung cancer rates in um, uh, Japan with those in the United States. And the Japanese had a very low fat diet, where Americans had a much higher fat diet. And so we had about a factor of two difference in lung cancer rates um, between the two countries for the same amount of smoking. So uh, I think this means that, that uh, diet and smoking play a role here. Uh, I should point out, we, we just had this discussion about the ethical f uh, considerations in doing randomized controlled trials. In the ecological studies, as far as I can tell, there are no ethical studies because people are living where they want to and, and if they go out in the sun, uh, they do. If they smoke, that, you know, that's their own choice. They're not being told, do this or do that. And it's the ecological studies that can harvest the data from all these un, um, undesigned uh, studies, these, these sort of accidental studies. Melanoma, we've heard about melanoma. And sure, it's a little higher in the south, the southern part of this country, than the north. But look at the rates. In the, in the highest parts of the country, it's 1.2 to 2 um, deaths per 100,000 per year. In the south, it's around 3 to, three to 5 deaths per 100,000 per year. And um, the total deaths from, well, we'll get to that later, but it's, it's really uh, very insignificant in terms of the overall picture. So we have a number of mechanisms whereby vitamin D affects risk of cancer. Uh, in terms of cancer incidence, it affects the cellular differentiation, proliferation, and apoptosis. It also increases um, cancer mortality rate through two very important uh, mechanisms. One is reduced angiogenesis around tumors, and the other is reduced metastasis. It turns out that the effect of vitamin D on cancer death is stronger than the effect on cancer incidence. So part of the reason that the, the observational, the randomized controlled trials and some of the ob observational studies looking at cancer incidence may fail is that the effect of vitamin D on, on incidence is not as strong as on mortality rate. And the ecological studies that I've just showed were all on mortality rate. Uh, so we do have evidence from ecological studies as well as from some observational studies and laboratory studies and two randomized controlled trials. Uh, one is the uh, Joan Lappy, Robert Heaney one. Another is analysis of the reanalysis of the Women's Health Initiative study uh, in which they only looked at people who were not taking vitamin D or calcium before entering the study. Uh, we have observational studies support cancer prevention for, by vitamin D for breast, colorectal, lung, prostate cancer, and non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, there's a very interesting study that er apparently is not well known yet. This was done by uh, Rebel et al. And, and Frank de Gruel from the Netherlands. What they did was they took uh, mice who were genetically programmed to be very susceptible to developing intestinal cancer tumors. And they divided these, these mice into three groups. The control mice had uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D, around eight, uh, 3 nanograms per milliliter. Those fed oral vitamin D raised around, 70 uh, around 30 nanograms per milliliter. And those with UVB raised, I, th I think, in one sex is around uh, 80 nano nanomoles, and the other sex around 50 nanomoles. There was a, 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 s a sex difference, which I don't think they really understood. So then they looked at the intestinal tumor load, which is the area covered by tumors, at 7.5 months of age. For those with a taking oral vitamin D, their uh, area was 130 plus minus 25 millimeters square. For the UVB exposed group, it was 88 plus or minus 9 millimeters squared. And for the uh, control group, it was 202 um, uh, plus or minus 23 millimeters uh, squared. So you had about one-third reduction for vitamin D supplementation, but you had a over 50% reduction for the UVB. And so the conclusion was that there must be other mechanisms than vitamin D production which can, can explain how and why UV reduces the risk of, of, of intestinal cancers. And this may also help explain why the ecological studies um, are so strong and the observational and randomized control trials are relatively weak. Now, there's controversy about breast cancer uh, because the the nested case control studies that derived from cohort studies uh, with follow-up times longer than three years do not find statistically significant inverse correlation between 25 hydroxy vitamin D and breast cancer incidence. However, all of the uh, 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 case control studies 
in which 25 hydroxy vitamin D is measured shortly before or shortly after the incidence of breast cancer show very strong, uh, very significant inverse correlations. So what I've done here in this papers in press and anti-cancer research is I've taken 10 case control studies. Um, I've graphically adjusted them so that the, um, the observation, the odds ratios or relative risk overlap and then fit a power law to these uh, studies. And you see that below 40 or 50 nanomoles per liter, uh, there's a very strong uh, gradation. But you get around 75, 80, uh, you're more or less plateauing. There's maybe a little bit, uh, there is a paper from England by Lowe et al, which has the lowest uh, rate. Um, but you see that, 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 that um, it's a very nice curve. And I think it, it, the, the, the detractors like to say there's a reverse high, um, causality, that the fact that people have breast cancer or, or whatever disease has affected the 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration. There are only two ways that can happen. One is that the disease itself uh, lowers the 25 hydroxy vitamin D, or the other way is that the, the um, lifestyle uh, of the person is, is modified because of having the disease. Well, in breast cancer, people generally don't know they have breast cancer until they're so diagnosed, so they're not going to uh, affect lifestyle. And because there's so little, uh, ev uh, little information in the public domain that vitamin D reduces risk of cancer, they're not going to start changing their vitamin D oral intake or, or go into a tanning bed or anything like that. So I think that these really do show a significant effect of, of vitamin D uh, from whatever uh, source on the effect of breast cancer. And I, well, I just explained this here, and I've, I published a couple papers on this topic in the past. And, uh, the thing is, if you look at 25 hydroxy vitamin D uh, with the same population 5, 10, 15 years uh, apart, you find by, by the time you get to 14 years, the R value is 0.4, the R squared is 0.616, and so you have very little correlation between the 25 hydroxy vitamin D at the time of the start of the study and at the end of the study. Uh, this is a paper from uh, Norway by Tretley et al. showing cancer survival versus 25 hydroxy vitamin D. They found significant benefits for lung cancer and breast cancer. Um, uh, not, let's see, for lymphoma, it was P was 0 0.07, so it's considered not quite statistically significant at the 5%, 95% uh, level. And for colon cancer, the P was 0.21. Um, so my estimate of the effects of vitamin D in, by raising 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration to 40 nanograms or higher for the entire population would reduce the burden of colorectal cancer by about 30%, breast and renal cancer by 25%, non-hydrogen lymphoma by 20%, liver, lung, pancreatic, and prostate cancer by 10%, and other cancers uh, 10 to 30%. The problem with, with liver, lung, pancreatic, and prostate cancer, uh, the first three anyway, is that smoking is a very important factor and, and diet plays a role as well. And so the role of vitamin D is, is sort of minimalized, uh, minimized in, the, in those uh, three cases. For prostate cancer, um, the evidence from, uh, well, the evidence is very strong that, that vitamin D plays a role for aggressive prostate cancer, but not so much for run-of-the-mill uh, non-aggressive prostate cancer. And even the ecological uh, study, the United States, uh, the pattern uh, for prostate cancer mortality rate is, is different from the other cancers in the highest rates in the northwest and the lowest rates in the southeast, and that we don't fully understand. Alzheimer's disease is a disease affecting 4 to 5 million people in the United States. Uh, the official death rate from the CDC is 160,000 deaths per year. However, a recent paper estimated that 500,000 Americans die each, uh, over the age of 75 years die from, uh, with, from Alzheimer's disease each year just based on the fact that life expectancy with Alzheimer's is about half of what it is for those who don't, compared to those who don't have Alzheimer's disease. Of course, they could kind of die from cancer or cardiovascular disease or, or something else. But anyway, if you get uh, Alzheimer's, um, you have it's a very poor lifestyle after that. So the, um, the precursor of Alzheimer's disease is cognitive dysfunction. And here's a study from Italy in which they found that, um, uh, that uh, based on a mini mental state examination, 
those who had between, um, I think it's, uh, if they had below 20 nanograms per milliliter, they had a um, uh, relative risk of 36% of increased risk of developing cognitive dys dysfunction. If they had between 20 and 30 nanograms, they had a 29% increased risk. So we've seen that the, pre the precursor I is affected by vitamin D. And it's also known that, that, the, that the vascular factors play a very important role in, in um, um, cognitive decline. Um, hardening of the arteries, it affects the, the brain as well as the body. So here's a, a recent study. This was a study, the authors are from England, but the study was from the United States. Uh, they looked at 1,658 elderly disease-free disease adults um, in participating in this uh, study from 1992 to 1999. During a mean follow-up period of 5.6 years, 171 participants developed all-cause dementia, including 102 cases of Alzheimer's disease. And here are the um, hazard ratios for the two outcomes versus 25 hydroxyvitamin D in animals per, per liter. And you see that the those around uh, 10 to 20 nanomoles per liter had over a factor of two increased risk of, of Alzheimer's and of dementia, whereas the plateau was around uh, 50 to 75 nanomoles per liter, uh, and then large uncertainty because of few cases at higher values. So from this, I estimate that um, raising the 25 hydroxy vitamin D to above 40 nanograms per milliliter would reduce incidence and mortality rates of AD by about 10%. Falls and fractures, um, I've, uh, well, vitamin D plays a role, but as Robert Heaney just pointed out, calcium and protein play a role as well. Uh, this is just one study from Bishop Ferrari from 2009, showing that it has 25-hydroxy um, vitamin D went up to around 100 nanomoles per liter. The relative risk dropped about um, by about 30 to 40 percent. And I estimate that the reduction in falls and fractures by increasing vitamin D would be around 20 percent. Here's a, the results of a paper by uh, uh, Cedric Garland and colleagues, again showing that people with the lowest, in this case it's in nanograms per milliliter, those in the 0 to 9 nanogram per milliliter range have a 90% increased risk, uh, higher hazard ratio than those above 36 nanograms per milliliter, and after that it pretty much plateaus. And again, this shows that if you get the physiological range of above 40 to 60, uh, you've got the best outcome you go to lower values, you have poor outcomes. Okay, just to discuss briefly about um, melanoma, uh, this is a study uh, from Australia. Uh, they looked at the effect of the pigmentary characteristics. They found that red-haired people have a relative risk of 2.64 compared to, I think, it's dark color uh, uh, hair. Blondes, 2.0. Light brown, 1.46. Uh, eye color makes a difference. Um, skin phototype makes, uh, makes a very important difference. And what they did then was they looked at the uh, uh, population attributable factors, um, finding that skin phototype, um, uh, that could uh, they could attribute 27% of, of melanoma to skin type. Freckling could attribute 23%. Blonde hair, and, and, and uh, to 23 percent, um, and so on. So it appears that constitutional factors play a very important role in, in melanoma. So a lot of the melanoma comes from those who probably should not be out in the sun as much as those who have, um, who are more adapted to the sun. They uh, did another study for, for basal cell carcinoma, which is the most common type of skin cancer, but the least deadly, and found very similar e effects. Basal cell occurs deep in the epidermis, just like melanoma does, whereas squamous cell carcinoma, the, the most hazardous type of um, non-melanoma skin cancer, occur occurs more at the surface. So um, let's see. This is a, um, a study from the women's uh, from Harvard, uh, based on their nurses' health study, and they found that um, those. Uh, let's see. Uh, those with the highest amount of UV exposure had a relative risk of, of um, basal cell carcinoma of 2.35 uh, and similar 2.53 for squamous cell carcinoma. Um, 
but they found for mel uh, and for melanoma uh, 1.8. Um, this okay. Th when they looked at people with with, with um, blistering sunburns, um, they found uh, an important risk there as well. Uh, so they found um, significant interaction between family history of melanoma, number of blistering sunburns between the ages of 15 to 20 years, uh, for basal cell carcinoma risk, and between uh, sunburn uh, reaction as a child, or adolescent, and, and squamous uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Um, the, if you look at melanoma, however, chronic uh, exposure uh, is generally not associated with increased risk. It's the recreational uh, sun exposure and sunburn that are strong predictors at all latitudes. And um, whereas occupational and total sun exposure seem to predict melanoma predominantly only at low latitudes. Um, Ed Gorham and, and Cedric Garland wrote a paper in 2007 in which they pointed out that um, sunscreen protects against melanoma at below 40 degrees latitude, uh, which is approximately the California-Oregon border, whereas for people who wear sunscreen at higher latitudes, it actually increases the risk of melanoma. The main reason that appears to be that, that sunscreen sold in the United States do not block UVA adequately, and the FDA has been sitting on approving more UV blocking compounds since 2002. I understand that President uh, Obama just signed a, a congressional mandate to the FDA, get off your ass and do something. Uh, approve these compounds been used in Australia, uh, Japan, and Europe, and, and let's make sunscreen a, uh, a more, blo a more blockage. So now we turn to deaths and years of life lost. Uh, um, I, there's a paper I rely on here uh, from 2013 which looked at uh, disease, deaths, and years of life loss for the 13 most important uh, cause of death in the United States. Um, and I then looked at the direct cost for these uh, diseases, uh, getting data from other various sources. I assume that the reductions in cost will be calculated from the percent of incidence or death reduced by increasing 25 hydroxy B vitamin D to above 40 nanograms per milliliter. So um, uh, I thank uh, Rafael Cuomo for uh, pre preparing these uh, graphs. If we look at deaths, this is reduced deaths from, from cancers. Colorectal cancer, uh, that's about 60,000 total deaths, but the reduction is around 20,000 deaths from, uh, uh, that I estimate for, for vitamin D. Lung cancer had much higher um, uh, mortality rate, but I'm only assuming 10% of the, the deaths can be reduced. So that's around 18 thousand deaths per year. Breast cancer about 12,000 deaths per year. Kidney cancer around six uh, and so on. Uh, for cardiovascular disease, ischemic heart disease has the uh, greatest uh, burden. So maybe 110,000 deaths per year could be uh, prevented with vitamin D. Uh, going down by stroke, diabetes uh, and so on. So if you look at total deaths, uh, it appears that cardiovascular disease would have the greatest contribution around 180,000 deaths per year uh, could be uh, reduced. Um, other cancers around 70,000, colorectal cancer around 20,000, Alzheimer's around 15,000, breast cancer around 15, 10 to 15,000. You've got uh, lower respiratory tract infection, um, COPD, falls and fractures, chronic kidney disease, diabetes. Now at the bottom in red are the total deaths from melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer. Not necessarily from UV, uh, Maybe it's two-thirds from UV, maybe it's half, maybe it's three-quarters, but it's not 100%. But just for sake of argument, I've, I've left in the total deaths. The total deaths is around 13,000 from melanoma and, and skin cancer, and that just pales by comparison with, with all the other um, uh, deaths that we could reduce if we re increased vitamin D through either UV, uh, sun exposure, or from oral intake. Um, so the 30 leading causes of death, 19 are linked to low 25 hydro hydroxy vitamin D. In that category, there, category there are 2.47 million total deaths, uh, with 1.86 million uh, from the 19 causes linked to vitamin D, and 0.26 uh, million from other 11 causes. Based on the analysis outlined in my presentation, there could be 336,000 reduced deaths out of 2.1 million which is a 16% reduction. The uncertainty is probably uh, about half of that. In other words, the reduction maybe is, is 8 to 24%. Uh, 
in uh, 2011, I published a paper in which I looked at the uh, an estimate of reducing mortality rate in six global regions when 25 hydroxy vitamin D increased from 22 to 44 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, and the continental mortality rates decreased from 7% in Africa, where life expectancy is around 45 years, to 17% in Northern Europe, where life expectancy is 75 to 80 years. But it turned out, uh, interestingly, that life expectancy increased by two years in every continent. Uh, you have to look at the people in the category, uh, in the age group in that, c uh, that are dying in that uh, up near the upper end. And so the, resu the results of that study are very similar to the results in the present study, again indicating that around uh, life expectancy could be increased by about two years. Um, so raising 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations appears to be the most effective, most efficient and cost effective way to reduce the burden of disease and increase life expectancy in the United States. We look at years of life lost, and um, these are essentially taking each year and multiplying it by 14, uh, e each death and multiplying it by 14. So again, this, this just mirrors the, the, the deaths um, um, we saw earlier, uh, cardiovascular disease. And again, if you look at, uh, compare years of life lost from all the vitamin D sensitive diseases to melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer, uh, it's, it's uh, essentially apples and oranges or tail and body of the dog. Uh, look at the direct costs. Uh, we have plotted blue is the direct cost total in 2014 dollars. The orange is the uh, reduced direct cost. And you're going to see we have, um, even you take just breast cancer and colorectal cancer, uh, the reduced costs are greater than the direct cost for skin cancer and melanoma. Uh, if we look here at uh, cardiovascular disease, um, you get um, significant reductions. If you look at the total direct cost from my calculations, and these are could be should be considered preliminary calculations, uh, it looks like $129 billion could be reduced by vitamin D compared to um, $11 billion for the direct cost for skin cancer and melanoma. So no matter how you look at it, uh, I mean I I the, the, the benefits of increasing sun exposure and vitamin D uh, greatly outweigh the, the, the the risk uh, for melanoma skin cancer. So conclusion that raising 25 hydroxy vitamin D above 40 nanograms per milliliter for the entire U.S. population can reduce the annual death rate by 336,000 deaths per year, reduce the annual life years of life lost by 4.2 million, and reduce the cost of treatment by 129 billion. By comparison, melanoma and other skin cancers have an annual death rate of 13,000, annual years of life lost 180,000, and a cost of treatment of $11 billion. Uh, the objective repeated discuss the costs and benefits increasing vitamin D related behavior. These objectives were met. I thank the audience for your kind attention. Hi, Dr. Grant. Um, you didn't uh, differentiate at all between um, vitamin D levels uh, through sun exposure or UV exposure and oral intake. Uh, did you have any thoughts on that? No. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think vitamin D3 is vitamin D3. Uh, I think that D3 is more effective than D2. Uh, I, I don't know how many of the studies actually included D2 in the, in the 25 hydroxy vitamin D health outcome relationship, but uh, as far as I can tell, you get the vitamin D in the system and it has the same effect whether it's from sunlight or from um, uh, oral intake. On the other hand, there do appear to be extra benefits of sunlight compared with vi just vitamin D. So um, perhaps these numbers ought to be looked at a little bit more carefully in terms of whether, the, uh, whether we're using vitamin D as perhaps a, 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 an index of being in the sun or, uh, or whether it's just the oral intake. Uh, Dr. Grant, uh, in uh, about 2005, uh, a study group in East Tennessee University uh, published a paper where they, where they the end point of their study was cost. Uh, are you familiar with that? Um, I'm familiar with some of their more recent work in terms of, say, testing uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration in hospitals and finding that hospitals that tested more had reduced costs. 
the initial study that I'm familiar with uh, involved patients at the uh, VA hospital in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. They had 830 some patients, and in essence, they their their cutoff line was 20 nanograms per mL, and uh, about 40 percent fell under that cutoff line, and that 40 percent required 38 percent more dollars in health care, and then they went on from there in later years to look at the cost of testing versus the benefits. Right. And that seemed to be very much in line with much of what you're doing. Yeah, I've collaborated with those people, and uh, we've, they're still doing those studies, and they're still finding the same sort of thing. And it's too bad that what's done in East Tennessee isn't done throughout the country. Dr. Grant, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, $129 billion seems conservative to me. Would you agree that it is conservative because most of those studies are not as rigid as they should be in determining the outcomes? Well, uh, yes. I mean, I, I left off quite a few diseases like multiple sclerosis, uh, influenza, um, uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, periodontal disease, uh, dental caries. I mean, there are probably 100 diseases um, uh, which are vitamin D and UVB sensitive. And um, I, I was concentrating here on incidence and mortality rate. A lot of these things like dental caries don't cause death, but they have a large uh, economic burden. So that's a good point. I should really uh, inc uh, expand the analysis to look at others. And, and, but, but the other thing is, yes, the, um, it, it's probably, I mean, if you take a lot, some of these diseases, just apportioning the cost to the incidence or the mortality rate may underestimate because there's a lot of things like, like screening and, and um, uh, treatment, uh, just well, uh, mammography, for example. I don't know how many billion dollars a year that is, um, which is part of the whole breast cancer uh, thing. It's, it's, I mean, this is just a, a brief outline, and, and it has to be done in, in, in greater depth. <laughs> 